the the lab stuff, um, the lab is the iodine clock reaction um, lab, and it's a simulation by the Smart Sparrow folks. Um, so at some level, it's kind of like that entropy lab that you did last time. And um, I realized just in, you know, both how students did and feedback from students that um, it, in particular for this lab, it's probably good to just give a little bit more um, in terms of suggestions and, and hints. So general suggestions for any of these online labs, you know, as usual, read the instructions carefully and follow the instructions very carefully. Um, when we're in the in-person lab, if you kind of miss something, you can, you know, get help from, you know, me or whoever the instructor is. If you're online, you know, unless it happens to be a time I'm online as well, you can kind of get stuck and um, and it's just a pain in the butt if you if you do stuff wrong, you have to either, you know, totally redo or restart. Um, so just, you know, follow the instructions really carefully. And in particular, um, even though you're submitting everything online, it's really good to take notes and write down, you know, like the equations of the reactions that occur and your data and all that stuff because often you need it later on and you, you know, can't get back to the previous screen um, or, you know, you just, you know, if you don't have it written down, it, it's, it's a challenge to um, make everything else work. Um, in this particular lab, there's a table that they ask you to print out and use to keep track of pipetted amounts. So you're going to be doing um, pipetting of, I think, four different solutions into oh, four solutions plus water into two different flasks. And it's really easy to get the amounts wrong or the flasks wrong. So it's probably a good idea to use that table to keep track of the pipetted amounts. Um, and then if you mess up a trial, you can redo it and you really should redo it. Um, that's what happened to me when I did the lab myself a couple days ago. I you know, forgot to hit record at one point um, and, and so I, I lost a bunch of information um, on one of the trials, but I was able to just simply redo it um, and not restart the whole lab because it was my third trial. If I had to restart the lab, I'd have to do the first two trials all over again. Oh, hi, Jeannie. Uh, Gina, that, um, uh, just saw that you're in. We're um, partway through the lab uh, explanation and I'm uh, also recording it as well. So if you got a question, please ask. I'll try to pause periodically. Um, okay, so you can redo a trial if you need to, make a mistake, you can back up to check your history, um, and you can, if you, if you really goober the whole thing up, you can just restart the whole experiment. Um, that does mean you have to do everything all over again, but that might be better than, you know, getting a 3 out of 10 or something for having the thing be a complete mess. Um, this screen is actually from the Entropy Lab. But just as a note in terms of backing up and restarting, on the bottom sort of right, there's a back arrow and a forward arrow that lets you go through your history um, of the previous pages. And then this little clock thing here, if you click on the clock, a uh, list will pop up showing previous screens and there is a restart lesson button. And so you can click on that to just fully restart It'll put you back at the beginning. You got to do everything all over again, but also, you know, at that point, you kind of know uh, how how things are are working. Um, so sometimes it's better to do that than than just keep chugging along. Um, okay, so this week's lab, the iodon clock reaction lab, um, it's it's actually a version of a lab that we normally do in person. It's pretty close to the one we do in person, but a slight variation. And you're going to be investigating this reaction, which is the reaction of hydrogen peroxide H2O2 with iodide ion, I3 minus, and it's in acidic solution, so there's H plus. And you're um, investigating the kinetics or the rate of law for this uh, reaction. Um, and this reaction makes the I3 minus complex ion and water. Um, and we're going to call that reaction 1A. Um, 
And what's important to note is when you produce I3 minus, this I, uh, triiodide ion, and there's starch around, I3 minus and starch react to make a blue black complex. And so as this reaction progresses, as soon as you start making I3 minus, the reaction starts turning black. Um, now, the problem is it's really hard to time a reaction in terms of like how much reaction has happened if you're producing black stuff because it just gets black and then it gets blacker. Um, so what we do on purpose um, so we can see the, time, the change is we couple in this second reaction and we're going to call this reaction 1B where the I3 minus that's actually produced in reaction 1 the I3 minus that's produced in reaction 1 very quickly reacts with S2O3 2 minus the thiosulfate ion to regenerate I minus so it uses up the I3 minus that was produced in the first reaction and regenerates I minus and what that means is you don't get the I3 minus and therefore it can't react with starch because there because it's it it does it is used up right away before it can react with starch and so you don't get the blue black complex and we add only a small amount of the S2O3 2 minus so that as soon as that's used up then I3 minus has nothing else to react with other than starch and it turns blue black so what you'll see is after you know 20 seconds 30 seconds 45 seconds or whatever you'll see the black color appear and the black color appears when the small amount of S2O3 min, uh, 2 minus has been used up. And so that time then can be related to the rate of reaction. Um, so I'm going to pause, see if there's questions at this point. Um, on, that's just sort of the gist of what you're doing. You're trying to find the rate law or part of the rate law for experiment reaction one and we're forced to use reaction 1B coupled with it just so we can get an accurate timing uh, to determine the rate. So does that sort of make sense or are there any questions? Okay, if I don't hear a question, I'm gonna hope that that's not because you're unable to speak, but it's because things are okay. Okay, um, so here's kind of the, just the what I just said. The S2O3 2 minus reacts with I3 minus to form I minus and S4O6 2 minus. That prevents the blue black complex from forming and gives us a way to time, you know, a certain percent of reaction occurring. So we're getting initial rates uh, data. Um, okay, so what's going to happen in the lab? You're going to have some Ki solution, that's your source of I minus, some Na2S2O3 solution mixed with starch, that's your source of S2O3 2 minus and starch. You're going to have some H2O2 solution and some H2SO4 solution, which is the source of the H plus. Um, and then you're also going to have some deionized water. And so you'll have some beakers that you'll add, you know, some of these substances to one, uh, sorry, flask. You'll add some of these substances to one flask, some to another. You use the pipette. You have to do the normal pipetting uh, technique, change the tip, uh, make the amounts, um, what they ask for, etc. And then when you're ready, when everything's been pipetted, you'll take one flask and add it to the other. And it's kind of weird. You actually just place one flask on top of the other, and then that indicates that they're poured and mixed. And when you do that, this timer will start and then you're just going to watch the flask and wait until it turns black and when it turns black you click to stop the timer so when it starts timing then the time will will you know spin the timer stopwatch will start this start button will change to stop and when you click on stop it'll record or it'll it'll stop and uh, the time and then you're going to have to record it into your um, data. And so you'll do all this pipetting, uh, you'll mix them together, you'll uh, time the reaction, and you do four separate trials. And then once you have the data for the four separate trials, what's going to happen is you'll get to, I think some of this is on the previous page, on page 19, 
and then on page 20 where it says use a spreadsheet to set up five columns and then to do a calculation um, and this was sort of the probably the, the biggest main reason for having this little explanation is I'm going to suggest a different method than the spreadsheet that I think will be a little easier and it's also along the lines of other graphing that you're going to do for other stuff in the um, kinetics unit so it's it's actually just good practice in something else you'll be doing um, so my suggestion would be the following instead of setting up the spreadsheet we'll do this so here is the form of the rate law uh, the rate is equal to some constant k times the concentration of hydrogen peroxide h2o2 to some unknown power q times I minus concentration to some unknown power R times H plus concentration to some unknown power S. And to get the whole rate law, we actually have to find each of these um, exponents or powers and the value of K. In this lab, we're actually only going to find one of the orders. And you'll be glad that, that, that we only do that, that, that will be sufficient. Um, and so this is the general form of the rate law and we normally try to find the orders of the reaction in terms of each reactant and the and the rate constant and these orders will be either zero or one or two um, and the way that we do this is we note that from one trial to the next the rate will be different it'll change uh, in this experiment you're changing the concentration of I minus but in this experiment, we're going to keep H2O2 and H plus concentrations constant the whole time. And now there's different ways we can then do the analysis. This particular experiment chooses to do the following. If you take this rate law and you take the log, the logarithm base 10, of both sides, you get this equation. Okay, and this is being recorded, so um, I'll be posting this video. Um, so if you can't write everything down quickly enough, don't sweat it. This will be posted really soon. Um, now, if you're familiar with logarithms, you maybe know when you take the log of a product, then you get the sum of the logs. And if you take the log of something to a power, then the power goes out in front of the log. So if that sounds familiar to you if you've done this before in math then you should say oh yeah okay here's what's going on and if not you're just gonna have to trust me that I did the math right um, and so taking the log of both sides gives you log of rate equals log of the constant K plus Q this co uh, this this uh, exponent times the log of H2O2 plus R the exponent for I minus times log of I minus and then plus S log of H plus and then the log of the rate is going to change from one experiment or trial to another as will the log of H2O2 but those other things as noted before are all constant okay um, and if I take all of these things that are constant these two terms and this one and just lump them together I get this so log of rate equals r log of i minus and a bunch of constant stuff. And this may not immediately be obvious, but if we think of log of rate as being like a y variable and log of i minus as being like an x variable, r is just a number, so that's like a proportionality constant or even a slope and then B is a constant or the the other stuff is a constant which is actually a y-intercept and so believe it or not this equation is actually the equation of a straight line y equals mx plus B if our y is log of rate and our x is log of I minus and then our exponent or order is the uh, is the slope and the constant is our y-intercept and we actually don't care about that and so if we were to graph log of i minus, which is x, versus log of rate, what we should get is a straight line with slope of r. And so your graph will look like this. Log of rate versus log of i minus gives you a straight line. 
and then the slope will be R. I'm doing another uh, tutorial later. At, at, this is a Zoom meeting, and I didn't get, get there at the beginning. He's doing another yeah. one at one, so we'll jump on that. And I think. Um, oh, and by the way, I'm recording it, so anything you missed will be available. Uh, no, I know I'll have to just do it while watching them, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, log of rate versus log of I minus gives you a straight line with slope of R, and the slope is going to either be pretty close to zero, pretty close to one, or pretty close to two. So if you get like 0.98, you're going to call that one. If you get, you know, 1.95, you're going to call that two. If you get 0 0.04, you're going to call that zero. Okay, so you're going to round off to the nearest integer. Um, and I made a little video, which already is posted on the website, of how to do this kind of graphing on your calculator. Um, but I'll, um, oh, and actually I'll just go back. So um, any questions on the gist of what's happened up to, up to now? We're looking at the rate law. We took the log of both sides. We did some rearranging and we found that if we graph particular things, log of rate versus log of I minus, we'll get a straight line which will let us determine from its slope this exponent for I minus in the rate law, which is the heart of what we're trying to find. Um, did that sort of make sense or questions at this point? Got more. Okay. Um, so on the graphing, um, I'm not sure how many of you have used your calculators for graphing before. Um, I have some other in sort of instruction on how to do this, in, and I think in one of the screencasts, and it'll also be in one of the classes. Um, and I know not everyone has a TI-84, but the basic idea pretty much applies in all calculators. Um, generally speaking, if you want to do graphing and then find the slope of the straight line, you go to the stat button and within the stat button, you should end up having some lists. So you're gonna enter data in lists, and usually it's lists L1, which is your X, and L2, which is your Y. Um, and then you'll enter the data in lists. Um, I highly suggest actually looking at the graph. So click on the graph button and adjust the window appropriately so you can see the graph uh, data itself. That if just if it helps a lot if you can visualize the data and see if it really does appear linear, like in this case it should be. Um, and then if it's linear, you're going to determine the slope by using the calculate function and doing a linear regression. And so your graph should look like this um, log of i minus, that'll be the data in list SL1, which is your x log of rate will be your data in list L2, which is your Y. It should look straight. And if you go to stat um, button and then calculate and linear regression, you get the slope, which will be the approximation of your R value. And like I said, I've posted a, I think it's four minute video, literally just showing me pushing the appropriate buttons with some sample data on how to do the make your lists and make the graph and adjust the window and then get the slope of the straight line from the linear regression. And that's up on the um, Canvas Kinetics webpage right underneath that lab.